satoma sagakamaya tamaso homaham jotir gamaya ritormam amritam gamaya avir avir mahi Rudra yate dakshinam mukaha te namaham paha hinityam. <clears throat> Om, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. And reach us through and through ourselves and evermore protect us from ignorance by thy sweet, compassionate face. So my subject this morning is creation from the word. There is an ancient theory that this world was created by the word of God in the Vedic texts in the Shatta Pata Brahmana it says that in the beginning the creator alone existed and by the word he produced all creatures in the book of Matthew Christian Bible we're told in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and in the book of Psalms In the beginning, it was by the word that the Lord manifested and revealed, held heavenly heavens and the hosts within them. So let's look a little bit at this, maybe a little esoteric subject, I hope you'll find something of interest in it. We can begin with the divine language. Is there a divine language? What language does God speak? Well, we read there in the Bible, how God created and said, let there be light, and there was light. And so he's uttering words, there is language. There is a divine language. God spoke to Adam. Adam spoke to Eve. Eve spoke to the serpents. What language? Well, sometimes scholars refer to it as the Adamic language but it's just the same divine language with which Adam also named all of the plants <coughs> and the creatures in the garden. And time passed. And uh, people continue to speak that same, what soon became the universal language. All mankind spoke the same until, uh, well, in the course of history, in the city of Babylonia, there rose a very proud king, Nimrod. And Nimrod had the bright idea 
that he would build a tower reaching up to heaven. And that would be his crowning glory of his reign, how he was already the king. But what would people think if he had built a tower up right up into the world of the gods? And so he ordered the building of this tower and thousands and thousands of people began working on it. And they built and they built. It became higher and higher until it came to the notice of God himself. And he looked down with great disapproval on this prideful work of the king and Nimrod. In fact, he became angry and directed the inhabitants of the air to break down that tower. And then God made it so the people could not understand each other. They didn't know they couldn't communicate. How could they continue to do their work at all? And then he took all those different people, scattered them to different parts of the world, different parts of the earth. And so here we are today. Everyone speaking a different language. Completely have we forgotten the universal language. Now let's look a little bit at that. I'm coming at our subject a little roundabout way. Let's look at that uh, idea. of a universal language and the idea of the tantras which is called natural name. Everything in this world, particularly all individual holons, are made up of moving material forces. By material, of course, they mean the akasha the ultimate primal, primordial matter. And the force is prana. And the prana is working, as this, is, this, that's the stuff of the universe. And then there's the, 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 the power that moves the stuff, that's the prana. And where does the akasha move? Well, the akasha is, uh, is just uh, ether, it's just space. Where can space move to? It can't move at all. In fact, every, any movement there is in the universe goes in cycles. It's circular in form. And as it cycles around, it forms a, a motion, a vibration. And vibration is sound. And so this morning we're talking here about the philosophy of sound. Nada yoga. And um, everything in this world has a characteristic sound, maybe many different ones. If we listen, we can hear the rustling of the leaves in the trees, and uh, we can hear, does the fire, yeah, yes, there's a crackling sound of the fire. And yes, you listen to the babbling brook, we recognize it as such. But these are just gross, audible sounds available to the human ear. Behind these sounds, there is a world of subtle sound. And behind that, there is a world of causal sound. And behind that, there is the Nada Brahman, that is this perfect being. So everything has not only the kinds of a sound that we associate with it, but there's a deeper natural name. Someone asked a young girl, uh, what's the name of your dog? 
And she said, well, we call him Fido. We don't know his name, but we call him Fido. She had an insight somehow into a great philosophical truth that everything has a natural name, a signature sound, a movement and a causal, a causal stress in the ether, which uh, is its root sound. We could call it its mantra. And this is the doctrine of the Tantra, Mantra Shastra. Everything has a root sound. And we, uh, well, we can't hear it. All that we hear is the gross Vaikhari Vak. But there are, there are some, maybe some yogis, more particularly there's the greatest of all the yogis who is called Brahma Hiranyagarbha, <coughs> the cosmic man. He has a cosmic ear, and he can hear all these natural names. Now these names, of which we're not aware, are, we refer to things, different things. We see there's a horse, what is that? We point at that, what is that? That's a horse. Someone else says, it's, it's, it's a cheval, a Frenchman. A Spanish person may say it was a caballo. They're all pointing at the same animal. That's because we're using we're using vikari vak. That means we're using human speech. And of course, we all have different words. And yet, the uh, teaching of the mantra shastra is that the mantra has a shakti. That means it has a power to evoke and to produce the form that's associated with itself. Everything in this world, the teach, fundamental teaching of Vedanta, which you will read, everything in this world is name and form, plus Brahman. So we have the name and we have the form. That is the word And it's all about, uh, well, how does that happen? How is it these are two integral parts of the same thing? The name and the form. Now, there was a famous German physicist. His name was Ernest Kladny. He's sometimes referred to as the father of acoustics. He's the one who kind of first discovered in Western history of science that vibration, which is one of the most ancient concepts in the Vedanta philosophy, how everything begins with vibration. Yadidam kinjajagatsaram prana ejatinisritam. That's the Rig Veda. That's the oldest philosophical religious scripture in the world. There it says, in the beginning, all that existed was the prana. That means energy in vibration. And so uh, Cladney demonstrated, he was also a musician, that if you take a plate a metal plate and you distribute on that plate some very fine grained sand mm. and then you run like a, a violin bow. He had different methods of making that plate vibrate according to different frequencies. Now here again we're evoking the word frequencies <laughs> which is kind of those of us raised in a in the New Age philosophy, we may have some associations with the idea of things at different frequencies. 
but let's be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater because that's a very, very ancient idea. The point is that Cladney applied that vibration to that metal plate and he found that the sand for, it, it assembled itself into, into very striking, uh, beautiful forms. And as he changed the, the he changed the frequency, it would, it would it would shuffle itself into different forms, and the forms and the, and the frequency were always matched one with the other. And so similarly, it is with the idea of the mantra shastra, that the origin that the that the that the name generates the form, that the name not just generates the form, the name is the form. That's why they say the mantra of the devata is the devata. And it reminds us sometimes of the, some, about the uh, stories that we've read, maybe about some great Tibetan yogi in the Himalayas, freezing cold and snow, and how by repeating rom, that's the that's the bija mantra of fire. He can warm his body and in fact create a fire around him. So they survive in that winters of those Himalayan snows. Similarly, the idea is, is that God may like a great cosmic yogi have in fact manifested and created this world through the repetition of sacred sounds. Now, uh, if we take, if we assume, let's assume that everything has a natural name, it has a sound, and uh, what if we put all of these sounds together of everything in this room, of each, every person, an object in this room that would form kind of, uh, those would all kind of come together, all those sounds resonating together. And in fact, the, the yogis, uh, the ancient times, they spoke of the universal sound that is, what if we put all the sounds of everything in the world together? What sound they would come <laughs> out together? What would that sound be? Well, we don't know. But it is revealed to us in the scriptures. That sound is Om. And so Om is the very best candidate for the word, when we say in the beginning was the word, the word Om represents the sum total of all matter and energy in this world. And it stands somewhere uh, halfway between the interface between creation and God. God has thousands of names, but his name, the name of God, as is chanted by the de his devotees, always begins with Om. That's the root sound. And so Om is the sound of the Nada Brahman, the sound Brahman. Now this Nada Brahman is spoken of in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 15th chapter, it gives us a, an analogy, which is oftentimes referred to a famous analogy of an Ashwatta tree. Uddvamuram adashakam ashwattam prahuravyam. There it says, first verse, first line of the 15th chapter. There is an eternal Ashwatta tree, that is like a banyan tree, which exists in heaven, but its roots are in heaven, 
and its branches are below. <coughs> That's a striking image. You see the, this glorious tree coming down from on high with its branches below. This is the om. That is, it begins with a trunk. And out of the trunk, there emerge the branches. And the branches are the proliferation of the, the, the integral sound becomes divided and uh, the, the logos becomes manifest as the logoi. That is, the one idea becomes many divine ideas. We could call this the world of the Vedas. The Vedas. So let's look here at the, the idea of the Vedas. In Vedanta, you've heard spoke of the Vedas, usually referring to four big books there of revealed uh, scripture. <laughs> but as Swami Vivekananda points out to us, by the Vedas, no books are meant. What we really refer to is that transcendental world of ideas, eternal spiritual truths that existed from the, from, that is, that are eternal, they're incorruptible, that exist before even the manifestation of God. And uh, the truths of the Vedas reveal to us the nature of the soul, the existence of the soul, the nature of the soul, the existence and the nature of God, the existence and the, 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 the nature of this world and the relationship between them. All of these are things which are transcendental truths which we can never know by uh, sense perception. We can never know by uh, the process of reasoning and logic and induction and deduction. The only way that we can know about these things is through revelation. And therefore the importance of the verbal testimony in the Vedanta philosophy, that is the scriptures which reveal to us these higher truths. Now we can distinguish maybe between, as students of comparative religion, a good to distinguish in our mind between the Vedas and omniscience. Now usually when we're, we read about God in the Western traditions, we're used to hearing and learning that God is omniscient. That is, God is all-knowing in general and in detail. <coughs> God knows the, all the, all is aware of all true proposition, propositional knowledge. He has infinite, unlimited perceptual knowledge, conceptual knowledge. But God has all knowledge. He's omniscient. The Vedas, however, are refer to only those spiritual truths, those ultimate <coughs> uh, highest truths, which are eternal and exist before the creation. So this, this is a, one of the teachings, Vedanta philosophy. There is a transcendental world of ideas which is accessible to us through, um, through revelation. 
And at this point, we can't help but uh, compare, and are my students of comparative philosophy, we can't help but compare the doctrine of the Greek philosopher Plato. You remember, if you see the famous painting by Raphael, it's called The School of Athens. All the Greek philosophers are portrayed there in that one painting. And on the left, as we look at the, at the painting, there's Plato. And on the right is Aristotle. Two radically different approaches to philosophy. But Plato stands there with his hand pointing, forefinger pointing up into the sky, up into the heavens. And his teaching is that there is a world of divine forms. There is a world of, that is, that is behind everything in this world, there is an idea. A pure and perfect idea which is behind it, which we're not aware of. And this is called, these are the divine ideals, the forms, the universals. If we look out and we see a horse, we say, yes, that's a horse. A little bit later, we look at another place, we see, oh, there's a horse. Oh, there's another horse. And the philosophers ask, well, how is it possible that we know that, there, that we use the same word for all those three things? How do you know that, they're, that they are the same thing? Well, the only answer, the only reasonable answer that we can give is, is that there is within us an innate idea. The word refers to an innate idea in our unconscious, an idea that we had for all eternity. You know, Plato believed in the great cycle of reincarnation and, and uh, immortality of the soul. We always knew about that idea. That ideal horse idea is, is implanted in our psyche. And thus we recognize it everywhere, everywhere where we see it instantiated uh, in the world. And so this is the, this is the idea of the, of the platonic. I, I offer it just as a point of, of interesting comparison this is not a, a, some doctrinal thesis that the uh, um, equa e equation, but just a kind of an interesting point of uh, for, uh, for our reflection. Swami Vivekananda discussed this idea of the of the world of Platonic forms in Thou's Not in Park. You can read for yourself his uh, his. Uh, discussion in the inspired talks. So um, this is the world of ideals. Uh, different there. What's the difference? Well, the difference is, is that uh, far, down, far beneath that is this world in which we live, the world of change. There's a changing world, then there's the eternal world, the eternal world of changeless ideas. And we, what is our connection with all of that? What is our connection with the Vedas? Well, Plato gave that beautiful analogy of the allegory of the cave, which you know very well. But that explains very well to us what is, how is our condition today? How we see through a grass darkly, how we can rise up out of our condition and become aware realize, as saints and sages, rishis have, the true nature of things that is the divine, in the divine world of the Vedic truths. Now, in the, in the beginning, arose the creator of this world. Brahma Devanam Pratamasambhuva Vishwasyakarta 
Bhuvanasya Gopta, you can read. In the Mundaka Upanishad, there arose Brahma, the creator of this world. We've discussed it on other occasions. But Brahma is different from the Judeo-Christian um, creator. Well, maybe not. Brahma is, uh, first thing is, he is the, he's the Logos. Now the word Logos, it says, uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. What's the Greek for that is Logos. Logos is a word which means uh, like the Sanskrit Shabda. That means it's a word which we really should incorporate into English, but it has never happened. That is, in English, we have different words for the name and the form. Whereas the Logos, or the Shabda, is the same. The name is the form. And so Brahma is the... Um, Brahma is the, uh, the, the personification of the Logos. Brahma is called the Mahat of the Sankhya philosophy. Mahat means the all-powerful, the greatest all-powerful being. What means what? Is he rules over the prana. He controls all of the prana and akasha. That's, a, that's antecedent to matter and energy is the Mahat that is cosmic intelligence. Now in the beginning, this cosmic intelligence, Brahma, he's going to create this world. <clears throat> what does he do? He has to have knowledge. And so he begins, he goes to the source of all knowledge, which is the Vedas. And there are revealed in his mind the that's as he meditates on the words of the Vedas. He needs to have those words. Now it may seem to us that the, uh, that the idea that the, that the, some, it may be somewhat mysterious to us or strange that God should have to think of a word before he cre can create anything. And, uh, and yet, if we think about it just for a minute, we can see that it's not strange at all. It's not mysterious at all. In fact, we can't do anything without having an idea beforehand of what we're going to do. And in order to have an idea of something, you have to recall the word for it. You can't think without words. There's no, uh, I mean, you can't sing without notes. You can't uh, compute without numbers. Similarly, you can't think, you can't have an idea without words. Even God can't think without words. And so we begin to see the significance of the idea of the creation from the word. And so, uh, well, Brahma, so now he's meditating and contemplating these words of the Vedas. Every word in the Vedas is sacred. We recognize there's a cow, there's a horse. Why? Because there's a cow and a horse in the sky. That is, in the transcendental world of the platonic forms. So Brahma... He first, as he's, he created the world, um, so we're told now, I'm going to quote to you from the Taittiriya Aranyaka, where he says that in the beginning, he began to create the world, 
and he uttered the word boor. And the whole solar sphere appeared. Now, as you know, in Indian mythology, there are 14 worlds. There's seven below and there's seven above. Bhur, Bhava, Swar, Mahar, Janas, Tapasatyam. So this is the first of the worlds which is being created. That is Bhur. And it appears. Now we can think, uh, let's look back at that just for a moment. Because uh, let's take a potter. A potter is going to make a pot. What's the first thing that he does? He has to, first thing, he has to come into his mind. I'm going to make a pot. But in order to make that thought, you've got to have the words. So he gets the idea of the pot. And then he uh, takes the clay. He's the efficient cause. You're the material cause. And uh, then he begins to form the pot. Similarly, it is when God creates this world. And when I say it is, remember, I'm telling you a creation story. I'm telling you how it really is. Telling you how they say it is. So he, uh, uh, let's say the potter is going to make a pot. How did God create the world? Oh, it's easy. A pot, you know how a potter makes a pot. Similarly, it is uh, it, you know, the divine creation. Only God does not have to lay his hands on the clay. His knowledge is his tapas. That means in order to do something, you have to do tapas, that means you have to concentrate your mind, you have to focus your energy, you have to generate some enthusiasm or some focus in order to create that thing. You have to fire that pot. But Brahma does not lay hands on any material thing. That is, he creates through tapas. That means through the power of his spiritual energy. There's that word again, energy. And uh, here's the idea, the idea, if we think back through what we've read, this is spiritual power. Now what is spiritual power? It was, it's kind of a mystery, well, it is a mystery to us. We know in reading uh, books on soul, God, and religion, there's often we refer, there's reference here to uh, divine power, to uh, soul force, to the power of prayer, to the, uh, to the power of intention, to the creative power of, uh, of love. These are all mysterious powers. Similarly here, we're referring here to the power of tapas. Brahma created this world through tapas. And thus it was materialized. How does that happen? Well, you know, there was a, a sage. His name was uh, Vishwamitra. Vishwamitra was a, a king at one time. He renounced his kingdom, and he uh, retired to the world in order to do spiritual practices. He wanted to become a Rajarshi. That is a, a, a st higher status here among great sages. He did tapas for 1,000 years, and he became, uh, the gods conferred on him that title of, the, of a Rajarshi. Well, it so happens one day, uh, 
that there came to him a, another king. Uh, his name was Trishanku. And he had a strange request for a boon. That is, he had wanted to go and rise up into heaven in his physical body. Can't happen. It's impossible. Not allowed, according to divine law. And he had gone already to the greatest sage, Vashishta. Vashishta said, no, that cannot happen. Went to all individually, to his disciples. They all laughed at him. It's impossible. Well, he came to Vishwamitra, and Vishwamitra said, oh, all right. If you want to do that, he said, I'll grant you that boon. You will go, rise into heaven. Now, the words of the, uh, of the sage can never be false. And so he did his uh, ritualistic, uh, his uh, sacrificial rites. And then through the power of tapas, the king Trishanku began to rise up into the sky. And he rose and he rose up until he came to the very doorway of heaven. And, uh, but all the doors were closed. The gods would not accept the offering of Vishwamitra. Now, if Vishwamitra had one slight failing, this is one, his only shortcoming, that is, uh, he became, sometimes he became angry. And sure enough, it was refused. The offerings, offerings of the gods refused. You won't allow him in heaven? Very well, he said, I'll create worlds, my own heavens. I'll create another whole universe of heavens. And so saying, they began to materialize. And all those heavens appeared. And the gods were stunned and amazed to see that now they have a whole rival universe of other heavens. And then <laughs> Vishwamitra said, yes, not only that, I think I'll create a new Indra. And Indra, that is the Lord of the gods, hearing this and all the other gods, great consternation. What a terrible thing. This cannot happen. They went and approached Vishwamitra, sir. Please, begged him to please uh, allow... Uh, Trishanku to rise up into the heavenly constellation and there your words will be fulfilled uh, and, uh, and Vishwamitra thinks well okay he agreed that's because he'd used up all his power 1,000 years of tapas was gone he created all those worlds and uh, so harmony was restored between the gods and the heavens. But Vishwamitra had to return to the forest and begin again doing his sadhana to become my Brahmarshi. So I guess that's a, that's a story that illustrates to it the power of tapas. How these say physical thing, it's a physical thing that's happening. The worlds do not uh, exist just in our own imagination. They don't exist in our own mind. And so those worlds were created by that power. So let's look here at Brahma. Creates the world. His first word that arises in the mind. He uttered the word who. That means this world, the solar sphere, and the world arose. And uh, now if you read in the volume six of the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, there you will see a kind of a lengthy discussion of exactly our subject this morning. And the disciple who's recording the conversation raises an objection to this uh, idea. And he says, Swamiji Sharat Chandra Chakravarti, he recorded all those conversations. 
And so he said, uh, Swami, I have a, a question here. How is it possible if you were to go, now God has said, <coughs> and the world has appeared. If you want to get water from a fountain and you don't have a jug to collect the water, and if you just say, jug, jug, no jug appears. And Swami Vivekananda says, well, he said, of course not. As long as you say it like that. But if the idea arises in the mind of a perfect creator, then it must appear. The power, that's the power. Another power, spiritual power, the power of truth. And here the reference here is, a, is to maybe to a, to a uh, tantric doctrine. There are different levels of speech. He says, when you say it like that. In other words, he's referring to the vikari vak. That is ordinary speech. Ordinary speech that we have, you say something, nothing's going to jug, jug, not a jug's going to appear. That's, that's a work. But behind that, there is the subtle speech. And behind that, there is the, the, the causal speech. That is the pashyanti. This is the, this, is the, this is the thought and the speech of the creator. Now, what does that mean? What it says, it is subtle. Anything which is subtle or causal is more all-pervasive and is more influential than anything which is particular. And so it has control and precedence. The subtle has control of the gross. Our mind has control over our body. So the words first are that, that when he's can't not when you say it like that, he's referring here to the to the divine speech of Brahma. Not only that, here we look here, we see it's a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy of sound and meaning. And that which is higher, by the word higher here, it means that it is power. Power means a position of ascendancy. That means if you, uh, if you have a man and a woman and they go into a church and the minister uh, pronounces them, say, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Now, what has happened? In that instant, this single man has become a husband. This single woman has now become a wife. The a reality has changed. Uh, there, uh, however, what if an ordinary person were to come up to them on the street and say, I now pronounce you better, but nothing would happen. Why? Because he doesn't have power. You have to, you, he has to be in the pos that position of ascendancy. That's why he's the creator of the world. Okay, well, um, let me just uh, summarize this. The, uh, so Swami Vivekananda teaches us, how does it happen? This creation from the word, the word here is Om. And from the Om streams forth all of the many, the Shabdas, that is the universal ideas. And from those universal ideas appear the concrete world of particulars. And gradually, gradually, over time, this manifested world appears. Now you may say that this is, uh, this creation from the word. You may say this, uh, well, you know, in talking about the origin of the universe, uh, why don't we just stick with the old fashioned theory of, uh, of evolution. Uh, and the answer to that 
is very simple, and that is that the creation from the word, these creation stories in religion, have nothing, have no problem with evolution. This is on a completely different sort system. This is a, an explanation of the origin of things. It's a vertical explanation, not a horizontal. It's a, it's a synchronic account. It's not a diachronic account. It's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's, an, it's an involution. It's a, it's a story about involution, not evolution. Evolution presupposes involution. But there's no clash between them. Just as you were to explain a, uh, if you explain a movie, and you could go on and talk about the plot and the character development, what happened in the movie, you have a good review of the movie. But it would be a completely different explanation and approach if you were to dis begin with a discussion of how the movie was made. That's a whole different discussion. No clash between them. And so similarly it is with this doctrine of the creation of the word, a doctrine that comes to us from the has origin in ancient scriptures, and the words of the scriptures cannot be false. So I'm afraid that I held forth a little long this morning, and um, so good, I think maybe we'll, you think about what, what let, let this percolate through the factory of your brain, formulate some questions um, and some, that's the whole purpose of my talk for, for all of us and for myself is to give myself food for thought and contemplation of the scriptural texts. Om Dio Ho Shantihi Antariksha Ham Shantihi Pritivi Hi Shantihi Apa Shantihi O Shadaya Shantihi Vanas Pataya Shantihi Vishwe Deva Shantihi Brahma Shantihi Saravam Shantihi Shantire va shantihi, same shantire dhi, om shantihi, 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 om, peace is in heaven, peace is on the earth, peace is in the sky and the waters, the herbs and plants and trees are full of peace, the gods are peaceful. May this eternal universal peace enter our souls and beings. Om. Peace, peace, peace be unto us all. <laughs>